there's a gentleman sitting down here it's just ready to go and uh, so Ben if you would want to come forward and I think I'm ready to go after watching that. Wow, that was powerful. Well, if you remember a year ago, I actually preached a message and that, that spoke about Henry Wadsworth and that story of that song. Today we're gonna go a little different. Have you got my voice? I'll tell you. you I, I thank the Lord I was here this Sunday and not last Sunday because I probably would have called and canceled last Sunday because I had no voice. So it's it was two weeks. It's getting better. I was it's, it's it shows you how when you start thinking I was hunting season <clears throat> and I was worried about because I couldn't stop coughing. How is it going to be just sitting in my stand being quiet when I couldn't stop coughing? And then the Friday before the first Saturday. No, it was the Friday before the actual true first Saturday in Doe uh, that I, I quit coughing, but then I lost my voice. So I texted my loving wife, and I said to her, I said, good news and bad news. Good news is I quit coughing. Bad news is I lost my voice. And her reply back was, What's bad about that? <laughs> she's been she's been around me way too long. But anyway, it's it is coming back and so I apologize I don't have a song for you to sing because I don't have a voice to sing it. So it's going to still a little raspy but we're going to I'm going to look at the story of Christmas or the birth of Christ from and this is Christmas Sunday so Merry Christmas. I mean, it's a Sunday before Christmas, which is Wednesday. But uh, I want to look at the story of Christmas from a little different perspective this morning. Because we're going to look at the Christmas story out of the... Well, we're going to look at Christmas according to John. Out of the Gospel of John. And now some of you are probably thinking, wait a minute, I've read the Gospel of John a lot of times. And I don't know if I've ever remember reading the Christmas story out of John but I want to contend to you this morning that it very well may be the greatest of all the Christmas stories in Scripture because we're familiar with the stories out of Matthew 1 and 2 and the one that you read out of John where it was the, the one that's most read of the Christmas story is the one out of the Luke, Luke the second chapter but after today, I hope we look at John, the first chapter, in a little different light as possibly being the greatest Christmas story ever told, without actually mentioning the word birth. I sometimes wonder if we truly comprehend the glorious event that took place in, in history just over 2,000 years ago. And really the absolute brilliance of the Apostle John in how he described this event and what and who it was all about. You know, John might have been a simple fisherman, and he was. He wasn't a highly educated man. But his inspired word in his gospel, of course being inspired by the Holy Spirit, reveals an absolute divinely inspired brilliance about what he wrote. Now, some of you are probably thinking at this time, what in the world are you talking about, preacher? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I'm going to tell you. So turn with me to John 1, the first chapter of John, the Gospel of John, and let's look at it. John was going to use a term for Jesus Christ that both the Jew and the Greek could comprehend. Whether they would or not, that's beside the point. Because both of them had a history with the definition and meaning of the word that John was going to use in describing Jesus. Even though they approached the meaning of this word a little differently, John was able to bring the two together in this first chapter of John in such a way as to bring an understanding as to who Christ really was to both the Jew and to the Greek. So let's look. We're going to look at John 1 
verses 1 through 5, and then we're going to skip down to verses 10 through 14. Very familiar scriptures. It says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Drop down to verse 10. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this day, the time that we have gathered here together in fellowship with each other and you. We simply ask you to open us, open up our spiritual hearts this morning, our, our spiritual eyes and ears. We may hear what the Spirit has to say to the church this morning and understand what John was trying to say to us, uh, the children of God, and to those that needed to hear and that needed to come out of the darkness into that wonderful light of Christ. So we put this all into your hands, Lord, to give us the years of wisdom to understand what John was saying to us. And we'll put the remainder of this service into your hands and we'll give you all the praise and glory for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So John, maybe more than any other writer of the Bible, was able to grasp the essence of who Jesus really was and he was able to do it in a way that could be comprehended by both the Jew and the Greek. And again, if they chose to see it. And that's important for the fact that he came to earth to be an example of and to die for both the Jew and the Greek, or the Jew and the Gentile, to save both. So in using the Greek word, and the Greek word for word is Logos, L-O-G-O-S, okay? Keep that in mind. So he used the Greek word Logos to describe Jesus. So John hit both the Jew and the Greek with meanings they were both well acquainted with, though it came from a different perspective. So the word itself in the Greek has various meanings. In, in its, uh, what do I want to say, uh, in its traditional meanings, in its worldly meanings, I guess we could say, it can not only mean word, it can also mean thought, it can mean speech, it can mean meaning, it can mean reason, proportions, principle, standard, or logic. But see, it's in the religious meaning that the Jews would most understand this. And John knew it. So here it can indicate the divine word, the divine wisdom, the divine truth. And this is the meaning that was used all the way through the Old Testament. And the Jews knew the Old Testament very well. Especially the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. So they understood when you started talking about divine word, divine wisdom, or divine truth. What they didn't understand and what we understand now, that the Old Testament writers and prophets were writing about the pre-incarnate Christ when they spoke of the divine word or the divine wisdom or the divine truth of the Old Testament. Now the Greeks on the other hand, they also used this word, logos. But they used it more in the philosophical way because they were very logical, philosophical people. So the great philosophers of Greek down through history from the beginning to those like Heraclitus and Socrates and, and Aristotle and down through the Stoics, they use this word logos to describe, now get this, to describe an impersonal but a very powerful force that they saw as the universal law or the principle that inherently ordered the universe or the cosmos and it regulated the very being. 
It kind of sounds like that coming out of the Star Wars saga, the Force. In thing, in something, in everything, a part of everything. That's really the way the Greeks saw this Logos. They understood Logos as the animating power of the universe. They saw it as the conception of the cosmos. And they understood it as the principle that gave life and order to all beings in the universe. In the universe. You know what? They weren't that far off. They were really close of understanding the truth of what the Logos was. And they just needed someone to bring it all into perspective. And John, really in John 1, did that. Now, let's go back to the meaning of that that the Jews would understand. And, and really they had been taught from a very young age. Because again, they knew their scriptures well. The first, well, of, of the first five books of our uh, Bible is the, the, the Pentateuch. And they studied, that's what their scriptures were that they studied. As well as down the, later on the scrolls of Isaiah and some of the other prophets. But they're confronted with this understanding of what John wrote right at the beginning of Genesis. See, John knew that the Jews believed in one God. Right? Almost sounds like a bird chirping, doesn't it? It's okay. But see, the Jews believed in one God. And the thought of Jesus being divine and putting him on par with Jehovah was really an anathema to them. But see, for him to be understood as the Messiah, John had to be able to get across to them that Jesus was and needed to be divine. And to do so, he had to put Jesus with God from the very beginning. Which he does when he calls him Logos, the Word of God. Because the Jew is smacked right in the face with this reality right from the beginning of creation because they saw that God brought everything into existence by doing what? by speaking and this was understood by the word logos the word of God so John also emphasized this divinity or pre-existing or always existing of Jesus when he used the word was along with Logos. Because the word was in the Greek conveys the idea of no origin for God the Father or for the Logos the Word of God. And it conveys the idea of simply a continuous always existence. And it really goes perfectly well with Genesis. In Genesis 1.1 In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But how did he create it all? He did it by the spoken word, the Logos. In verse 3 of Genesis 1, and God said. Verse 6, and God said. Verse 9, and God said. Verse 11, then God said. Verse 14, and God said. Verse 20, and God said. Verse 24, and God said. And, And probably the greatest of them all is what we see in verse 26. And this is the one that should have been the kicker for the Jew to understand the divinity of the word of the pre-incarnate Christ. Because verse 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. He didn't say, Let me make man in my image, in my likeness. He used the plural. So from the very beginning, before creation of the world, the Logos was with the Father, for he had always existed with him, along with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And thus, that's where we get the Trinity. It was also important for John to use the word Logos instead of the Son of God. Because of what would have, that would have conveyed to the Greek. See, the Greeks believed, they were pantheistic, which means they believed in many gods. 
And not only many gods, but there were many sons of gods and daughters of gods. They called them demigods, if you ever studied Greek mythology. Those like Hercules, those like Achilles, and others down through history. They were considered sons of God. And so that would have put Jesus in the same category as them. But in using the word logos, he's calling Jesus the principal force of creation and the one who gives life and order to everything in the universe. None of their so-called gods or sons of gods ever were given that title. None of them. Now, with, with that understanding of Jesus as the great Logos, the Word of God, the Logos of the universe, we need to grasp just how magnificent and how awesome the miracle we see in verse 14 really is, which is the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. If you think about that, this miracle is probably greater than the creation and the resurrection put together. You say, well, well, wait a minute, preacher. How can you say that? Well, again, I'm glad you asked. It's greater because we expect an omnipotent, all-powerful God to be able to create and resurrect. We expect that. But who would have ever dreamed that he would willingly leave the splendor of glory to become flesh simply because he loves us. He wanted to totally understand how we feel and what we face in this world and the only way for him to do that was to become one of us. The one who created us became us but not by descending as a full grown man which he could have done. He could have descended out of heaven as a full grown man Messiah. He really could have. But there would have been one problem with that. He would have been divine but he really wouldn't have been human if he'd have done that. And in order to be fully human he had to come not as a full grown man but rather as to come as a little baby that was born of a virgin in a cold and stinking stable and laid in a feeding trough that was lined with hay. Now when you think of it, that is truly amazing. He is Emmanuel, God with us, who had to grow up like any one of us, experiencing all the world had to offer, which was pain, sickness, hunger, thirst, temptation, love, hate, loneliness, betrayal, rejection, and anything else this world could throw at him, which it did. And yet he was able to lead a sinless life. Even though he was tempted in all ways as we were, as the scripture says, he was tempted in all ways as us, but did not sin. You see, he had to live as one of us in order to be able to die like one of us, which is ultimately why he had to come in order to be able to pay the price for all our sins. It had to be a sinless, perfect sacrifice of a human for that to happen and take place. But there was one more thing that he did for us while he lived that helped us along our journey. And that was to be an example for us as to how we are to live our lives. See, Paul understood this principle when he said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And what is that example? Well, John tells us in verse 14 again. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father. Here's the example. Full of grace and truth. And this is how we are to live our lives, full of grace and truth. But the only way that any of us can do that, folks, is to have first received this wonderful gift of salvation that the living Logos paid for with his own life and blood. Because without that, none of us are able to even come close to following his example. 
because it takes the power of his Holy Spirit within us to give us the ability to do so. And you only get the power of the Holy Spirit within you when you receive the Logos, the Word of God, the gift of salvation that he won for us. But you know, even with the power of the Holy Spirit available to us as believers, unfortunately it seems that far too many who call themselves believers lack one of those attributes, grace or truth. Some fall on the side of grace, while others fall on the side of truth. And you know what? One without the other doesn't work. It's really quite disastrous. See, those who fall on the side of grace only, they end up being way too permissive and way too weak in confronting sin. And they only want your best life now on this earth. They just want you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Those are the ones that cuff all, all totally on the side of grace. But then there's those who fall on the side of truth. And without the grace and the mercy, they end up being way too legalistic and way too harsh in their confronting of sin. And we only need again to look at the example of Christ to see how grace and truth can and should work together and how then we should then live our, our lives ourselves. And probably the greatest point, case in point in all of the, uh, of the uh, New Testament was the woman caught in adultery that the men brought out that they wanted Jesus to use nothing but truth and what the scripture said needed to be done which was stoned to death but we know the story first of all the story wasn't complete because they only dragged out the woman if they really were interested in fully full truth they'd have drug the man out also because according to the truth of scripture both the man and the woman were to be stoned to death. So they were only working on partial truth. But they wanted Jesus to fall on the side of total truth. But what did Jesus do? He fell on the side of grace and truth. Because while they're there yelling their, their accusations against this woman, Jesus starts writing in the dirt. Some believe he was writing the names of all the men that had been with this lady. Make no mistake, she was a sinner. She was an adulteress. And as he was writing in the dirt, people started going away. I suspect when their name was wrote down, they dropped their stones and left. But it, well, he wasn't being permissive. Because after they all left, he said, where are all your accusers? So no one here to condemn you? She said, no. He says, neither do I. But then the truth followed. See, he acknowledged she was a sinner. She, he acknowledged she was an adulteress. He said to her, what did he say? Go and what? Sin no more. So there was the truth side of it. But the grace and the truth together was the way not only he as the word of God, but we as the children of God are supposed to be. And if we are, we admit it so often, we fall too, many, too much on one or the other without having them both together. And along with grace comes mercy. So let Christmas, according to John, which was the word became flesh and dwelt among us, the greatest gift the world has ever known, let that motivate us to live our lives with that same grace and truth that he did. But understand, that can only happen by first receiving that gift that came that first Christmas morning over 2,000 years ago. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Emmanuel, God with us, so receive that gift if you haven't already. And when you do, it becomes Christ in us with God for us and the Holy Spirit helping us and thus glory awaiting us 
Folks, it doesn't get any better than that. Merry Christmas. Stand with me, please. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your gospel, your Christmas message. Jesus became flesh. The Word of God became flesh and dwelled among us. And Lord, may each of us behold his glory. And may we receive that grace and truth into our lives if we have not yet. And may we live out that grace and truth if we have not been as one of your children. So Father, as we leave here today, may your Holy Spirit go with us to strengthen us if we belong to you, to convict us if we don't yet. And may the word, your word, which we can read in a Bible, which is really God's word, which really refers to Jesus as the word of God, may it light the way for not only us, but others who are living and walking in darkness today. That as we are speaking of the peace, we can enjoy that peace that passeth understanding, but we can only enjoy it when we receive that gift of salvation that he won for us on the cross by the shedding of his blood. The reason, the reason why he came. So Lord, go with us now. As we're going to sing a song, Lord, just to remind us of this and the reason for the season. May we just go out in your strength and your light to be that beacon to those who are still caught in darkness and point them towards the Logos, the Word of God, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, who is now with us, those who believe, and will now be with us one day forever in glory when we pass on. We give you all the praise and glory, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. What are we singing, Thomas? I believe silent. Is it silent night?